Hey everybody, John Mark here. Welcome to Mark My Words. Welcome to a video I've been planning to do for a long time and it's finally here. An in-depth analysis of who would win a second civil war or a second revolutionary war here in America. I'm going to go through an analysis by a person who claims to be a former red team planner for the government. I'll explain what red team planning is. And before I forget, after this video at some point I'm going to be interviewing a former member of the special forces who's going to talk to us about some of these issues and his view of what a civil war in America could look like. So make sure you're subscribed to my channel. And before I go any further I also want to make it clear I advocate for peaceful separation of right and left in America. So don't misinterpret this as me calling for you to take any action other than simply to make sure you and your loved ones are prepared and safe in this type of eventuality. Also before we get started I need to quickly mention why is this so important because a civil war is virtually certain to happen in America at this point. Very soon, half of the voting population will have no political representation. The right wing in America very soon will never be able to win an election again. Donald Trump is the last Republican president, whether he wins in 2020 or not, because 70% of non-white people vote left Democrat, and the vast majority of immigrants, both legal and illegal, into America are non-whites. And so very soon, not even the Electoral College will save the right wing. And so it's just a matter of time before the grassroots right figures out they'll never win any more elections. And when that happens, there's going to be a civil war. So that's why this video and this analysis is so important. What I'm going to give you by the end of this video is a scorecard. It's going to give you an idea of the advantages that the right has versus the advantages that the left would have in a civil war scenario in America. I'm going to have the various factors that would affect the outcome of a civil war in America. And for each factor, we're going to see whether the right has an advantage or the left has an advantage or if it's a tie. And in some cases, I will give one side or the other a big advantage if there's a really significant advantage that one side has over the other. And what I'm going to use as a starting point is an analysis I found online by a person who claims to be a former red team planner for the United States government. Red team planning is something that all sorts of different organizations do, including the United States government, of course. And what it is, is they set out a red team and a blue team and they run out a scenario to see if the organization can withstand some type of attack. So for example, in computer security, you'll have a company that runs a red team scenario where a group of people in the company pretend tend to be attackers or hackers and they try to attack the company's computer security. So that's what red team planning is. So this person is claiming to have worked for the government as a red team planner, as a person that said, okay, if I was going to be a revolutionary and attack the United States government as a revolutionary force within the United States of America, this is what I would do. And of course the government, we can assume, has run these scenarios many, many times. This person claims to have been involved in that. I have no way of confirming that, but I will tell you this, when I look at this person person's analysis, it is very hard for me to find much fault with it. And it's pretty thorough. It covers pretty much all of the bases that we would need to cover in this type of analysis. So I'm going to use it as my jumping off point, And then I'm going to add my commentary to it. And we're going to put together our scorecard and see where we fall. So let's start with what this person says. He says, former red team planner for the government here, the United States government has extensively studied the concept of second American civil war, along with the assumption that it will be left versus right. Hmm, I wonder why they might possibly do that. I'll interject here. Obviously, the reason the government would run that type of a scenario is because they know that's how it would play out. It would be the grassroots right wing versus the left and the elite establishment. That would be the teams. So this person continues. When they've run these analysis, their conclusion is as follows. They, the blue team, the government, the left, the establishment, don't have a snowball's chance in hell of winning. The moment civil war is declared, the government loses. No scenario or outcome ends in their success, period. It's just a matter of how long it takes. Let's get into more detail now with what he's claiming the United States government's analysis is. First of all, the U.S. power grid can be taken down by a series of surgical strikes. And the only exception to this is the Texas grid, which is independent from all the other grids. So he says here, by surgical strikes, I mean a few marksmen, U.S. Army tier marksmen would be the minimum requirement, 
could hit certain spots on the grid and that would mess up a lot of the military and government because they need the grid more than Bubba and his friends do. By the way, I will say from what I can tell, there are other ways of disabling infrastructure like this without having to have U.S. Army tier marksmen, but obviously that would be one way to do it. This person continues, additionally, while all government agencies have backup generators, they will be hard pressed dealing with the resultant looting and other madness that would come with power outages. This would effectively create another front for the military. I'm going to interject here. It's hard for me to overstate how important this is. If you have the power knocked out for days, weeks, even months on end in one of these major leftist cities, it's going to be everything that the military and police can do just to keep order much less to fight against revolutionaries. The police in these major cities are staffed just for bare bones crime suppression. That's it. The only exception is DC, which is kind of a militarized zone, and New York City, which has a little bit more as far as police presence. But any other major city, the police are not going to be able to handle it. The military would have to come in, and we're going to look at some of the numbers in a minute, but this is a very, very important point. The military and police would be fighting a two-front war. This person continues, it would also turn the people against the government more quickly and paralyze the government's propaganda machine. Worse still, the key points of the U.S. power grid are publicly obtainable information, and not only are the vulnerable points too many to be effectively guarded, they're not guarded anyway. So I'm not going to give you any detail on that. You can just Google that and find out that what this person is saying is true. You say, why in the world isn't this stuff guarded? It's because it's expensive. And as a person is saying, it would be very hard to properly guard all of these locations. Why is it so vulnerable? It's not like there's no backup built in. But the bottom line is it's very, very expensive. And without some kind of an emergency to drive it, there's very little motivation to spend the insane amounts of money that would be required to properly shore this up. So let's go to our first point on our scoreboard here, and let's call it leverage. In other words, which side has more ability to take actions that are really big bang for your buck repeatedly? In other words, you can get a lot of effect without needing to mobilize huge numbers of people to create massive difficulty for your enemy. The advantage here has to go to the right wing. It's a big advantage for the right wing here. The left establishment and the military have no equivalent ability to create such a big bang for buck type activity or leverage over the grassroots right wing revolutionaries. It's very easy to destroy infrastructure and create chaos. It's much, much more difficult to defend all of those vulnerable points and restore order once chaos begins. So a huge advantage to the red team there. This person continues. 30% of the American population will actively revolt. And he says, this alone is enormous and damning. Historically, you only need 10% of the population to actively participate in a rebellion to successfully overthrow the establishment. We only had 15% of the population actively attempting to throw out the British during the Revolutionary War. Roughly 70% of what remained was neutral and simply stood by. By contrast, 30% of Americans in modern America would support a revolution to stop their own government if it happened tomorrow. That's how discontent the people are and how much the people don't support the government. So this is this person's analysis or what he's claiming is the U.S. government's analysis. And from what I can tell, it's not too far off. So let's look at the numbers. 62 million people approximately voted for Donald Trump in 2016. And that's leaving out a lot of people in California and New York who didn't bother to vote because they knew it wouldn't count. So let's say roughly 65 million people would be Trump supporters or at least voted for Trump and like him better than the alternative. We divide that by 245 million voting age people in America and you get about 27% of the population voted for Trump. That's 27% of the entire voting age population. Now remember, huge numbers of voting age people don't even vote. All right, so let's look at some of the other numbers here. About 63 million people voted for Clinton. Now with more immigration, let's call it 65 million to be generous. So we've got roughly even numbers of voters for Trump and Clinton. And so we've got a total of about 130 million somewhat politically engaged adults. We also have 115 million non-politically engaged adults. And these people will be basically non-factors. They'll just be trying to survive in a civil war scenario. And most importantly, of course, we have to not just look at the numbers of people, but the numbers of people that have guns, the numbers of people that have the ability to exert some type of force, because anybody that can't exert some type of force is just a sitting duck and at best a non-factor. So most Trump voters have guns and many of them have lots and lots of guns. 
and lots and lots of bullets. Roughly 400 million guns in America and 8 trillion bullets. The great majority of that is in the hands of Trump voters. Most Clinton voters, the politically engaged left-wingers or left-leaning people, most of them don't have any guns at all because they don't believe in it. They're non-factors. So let's get back to our question. Would every one of these 65 million Trump voters actively revolt? Well, probably not. But you could say that the vast majority of Trump voters would love to see the swamp drained and are totally sick and tired of what our government and our system has become. Let's also keep in mind that the time is going to come when their choice is going to be to take action and revolt against the government in some way, shape, or form, or lose everything they value and be ruled by crazy social justice warrior commies forever. That's going to be their choice. And as per the previous point about how easy it is to disrupt infrastructure, there's no need for all these 65 million people to actively revolt. Not even close. And remember, too, roughly 10 to 15 million Americans have, quote unquote, alt-right beliefs. And the great majority of this group of people is already done with Trump. They've already given up on political solutions because they're seeing Trump call for more legal immigration, which they know is suicidal for Western civilization in America. So they're done with Trump. They have already given up on political solutions. And this group of alt-right Americans, 10 to 15 million people, is enough all by themselves to carry this out. So as we look at the raw numbers, let's look a little bit more at what this person says about the government's analysis. He says American civilians are armed and dangerous in spite of all of the attempts from the political left to disarm the American people. There are approximately 89 guns for every 100 Americans. Furthermore, we are one of the top three arms manufacturers on the planet, the others being Russia and France. The establishment would be in trouble even if their opponents were unarmed. I'll interject here and say, imagine the yellow vests in France and how much havoc they're bringing to that country and basically shutting down the country every weekend without even any guns. Imagine them with guns. And then he continues, any rebellion of the people in America is by definition an armed one. They could be easily armed further by stealing weapons or even outright being given them by sympathetic interests. Unsurprisingly, an overwhelming number of weapons manufacturers on American soil are deeply traditionalist, and the odds are good that many minor and at least one major weapons manufacturer in America would side with the rebels. He also says here that these quote-unquote teabaggers and right-wing extremists and oath keepers, many of them are veterans who now have more more time to have fun at the range, sometimes more than some army units or marine units do, in addition to previous military training. B, they often camp and do other outdoor activities, even more than many in the military do, as the focus in the military has gone away from field exercises. And C, they often have better equipment outside of armor and heavy weapons than the military. And he says here, the fact that the military has better armor and heavy weapons is kind of irrelevant because many of the places in which the revolutionaries could hide would make that kind of war that the United States fight with that type of equipment basically pointless. And what he's alluding to here is fourth generation warfare. For example, the United States military has had a very tough time in Afghanistan against a bunch of 90 IQ guys with flip-flops because they're fighting fourth generation warfare. So we'll get into that a little bit more in a second, but that's what he's hinting at here. So let's look at the raw numbers. We've got 50 to 65 million grassroots right-wing people. Let's say 10 million on the low side, alt-right people who have already given up on political solutions. In this grassroots right-wing group, it's majority men, it's majority white, it's majority gun owners. It's about 25 to 28% of the voting age population, which is much more than enough to carry out a revolution. They own most of the guns in America, which is about 400 million guns. Most of the current military and former military is in this group. The military voted two-thirds for Trump in 2016. So let's compare this now to the military numbers. We've got 2 million people in the military total. Only 1.5 million of that is active. And a huge percentage of that number of military people is not boots-on-the-street type people. They're stationed overseas or they're in the Navy, they're in the Air Force, they're not people that can just put boots on the ground to keep order. So boots on the ground, you're looking at maybe a million. And some people correctly point out that there's a very big effort to make the military more diverse, to put more women in the military and all of this. And of course, we all know one of the reasons they're doing that is because they want those people to be more willing to shoot against heritage Americans if it comes to that. But let's look at whether they're succeeding. Well, today's military is 44% non-white and about 17% women. The women are more diverse than the men in the military. 
and there are less women in the army and the marines which would be the boots on the ground people and more of them are in the navy and the air force and again the military voted overall two-thirds right wing so even a good portion of the non-whites in the military voted trump and the more boots on the ground type of people will be less women and thus less leftist because women tend to vote more left than men so that's the current military now, let's look at former military. There are many times more former military in the United States than current military. You've got about 20 million former military in America. 18 and a half million of them are men. A little shy of 2 million of them are women. So that means about 13 million, give or take, former military that leans right politically. And the other 7 million, and this goes for the other parts of the military in America as well, you have very few leftists in the military. Most of the people that would vote left would be classified more as liberal than like hardcore leftists. Very few hardcore leftists go into the military. That type of person just is not attracted to the military. The former military is also less diverse than the current military. So that's the military. We've looked at the former military. Both of those groups lean heavy to the right politically. Now let's look at the police. There are less than 1 million police officers across the entire United States of America. And remember, America is huge. America has 330 million people in it. You got less than 1 million police officers in America. So if we look at the total available military and police boots on the ground that would be available to the left establishment as their enforcement arm, because remember, the left establishment has very few people with guns in and of themselves, very few civilians. So they'd be completely and totally reliant on the military and the police to do their enforcement. And the total numbers of military and police that could put boots on the ground is somewhere around 2 million max versus you look at, let's say, 50 million minimum armed civilians, 35 million men minimum armed civilians, including 13 million former military, the vast majority of whom are men, that lean right. So let's go to our scorecard here. Raw numbers of armed civilians, big advantage to the right. Raw numbers of armed civilians compared to raw numbers of military and police, big advantage to the right wing. Enough to carry out a revolution if the grassroots right acts. Yes, advantage to the right wing here. If there were simply not enough numbers of grassroots right wing people to carry out a revolution in America, we'd give the advantage to the left here. But obviously there are way more than enough grassroots right wing people to carry out a revolution. So we give the advantage to the right here. We could even say big advantage, but let's just say advantage right. As far as the political leaning of the military, big advantage to the right wing. And this is still the case despite efforts to social justice warriorize the military. What direction do the police lean politically? This is a little bit harder to tell. It would either be a tie roughly or an advantage to the right. So let's just say tie to be generous to the left here. Now, this is just raw numbers. This is not the whole story, but it's important to grasp the raw numbers because it's a very important factor. And the story the raw numbers tells us is that the sheer number of armed people on the grassroots right is not possible for the left who have very few guns or the military and police who are small in number comparatively to deal with. And the military and the police, especially the military, leans right politically anyway. So if the grassroots right reaches a tipping point where large numbers of them act, no one will be able to stop them from doing literally whatever they want. And again, the grassroots right could actually achieve its goal. They don't even need remotely close to all of them to act. Again, 10% of 65 million is 6.5 million. That's way more than enough. 5% is 3.2 million. That's still way more than the active military and police combined. And remember, the alt-right alone is 10 million people, most of them men. So the raw numbers are massively, massively in favor of the grassroots right. Raw numbers of armed people that can bring force to bear upon the situation. Let's go to the next factor that this person outlines. The government would need infrastructure more than rebels would. Already working with significant handicaps, the establishment would need electricity, access to the internet, bridges, and airports to coordinate any active campaign against the rebellion. By contrast, the rebellion can work in the dark. See, now he's starting to talk about fourth generation warfare. Considering how easy it would be to sabotage U.S. infrastructure, one of the first things the rebellion would do is collapse bridges, destroy or seize power plants, and cover the interstate in IEDs. 
This is relatively simple to accomplish, and it would inflict enormous damage on the establishment's ability to restore order. It would also cost an enormous amount of time and effort to fix any sabotage, because the establishment would need to provide military protection to any workers attempting to rebuild, which is a drain their active fighting personnel resources that they could not afford. Logistics and infrastructure in the U.S. are crumbling and failing. Any war fought against a rebellion in the U.S. would be a logistical nightmare, even before the rebels started going full Al-Qaeda and putting IEDs in the road. A retired general who was contracting with us on the team said, The only thing holding together the United States infrastructure is duct tape and the will of the Department of Transportation. And often enough, there isn't enough duct tape. The most loyal cities to the U.S. government, as we polled, are also the most logistically easy to cut off. New York City, San Francisco, L.A., D.C., Baltimore. Most of these require crossing water to enter from certain directions. Most of them have critical airports. Some of them have critical ocean ports. If anything happened to just two of the cities on this list, it would create a logistical cluster bleep. Then he says, your Johnny Reb and Timmy Teabagger states, red states, all have something most of the progressive blue states don't. Blue states are mainly consumer states. Reds are producer states. Urban areas don't have farms. The second the shit goes down, realize a lot of these blue areas are likely to starve. In a Civil War scenario, we predicted that at least 10,000 people would die of starvation if the war was not finished in a year. The numbers get worse after that. I don't know if maybe he's missing a zero or two here, but 10,000 people dying in a year during a Civil War of starvation sounds like a very low number to me, considering everything he's saying and just the logic of this. So he's talking about fourth generation warfare here. And you can go study it. I'm not going to give you a whole breakdown here. But the bottom line is it's very easy for a civilian revolutionary force to create chaos and wreak havoc. And it's much harder to try to keep order and keep up with all of that. The establishment and the left are stuck in these big blue cities. They're totally reliant on electricity, heat, communications, water, just-in-time supply chain of food. I mean, all the food, all the goods are just-in-time supply chain because that's the economically efficient way to do it. And so it's not like these grocery stores have months of supply sitting around because that doesn't make any sense financially. Everything's just-in-time. So you go without any of these things for like two or three days, you're going to start having rioting, looting, roving gangs going around looking for food within a week. And so these cities need infrastructure much more than the revolutionaries would. People would start eating themselves in these Clinton archipelagos. And of course, this infrastructure vulnerability makes it possible for actors on the grassroots right wing to create a huge demand for restoration of order with relatively few people. They only need a fraction of their 65 million people to act. And they can create massive demand for restoration of order and bring their demands to the table. And that would be their most likely strategy. Fourth generation warfare is very hard for the U.S. military or any modern organized military to defeat. You also have coming to the fore in this fourth generation warfare. For example, the people in Afghanistan or in Vietnam, they're fighting for everything they value. They're fighting for their lives. They're fighting for their homesteads. They're fighting for their beliefs. Whereas the military is going to be just like obeying orders. If they obey orders, as we'll see in a minute. The other issue in fourth generation warfare, which is a huge factor, is that the rebels blend into the population when they're not wreaking havoc. They can just carry out a repeated strategy of hit and hide. And when they're not hitting something actively, it's very hard for the military to tell the difference between a civilian or a group of civilians that's just trying to protect themselves and a group of people that might be revolutionaries. It's virtually impossible to tell the difference. And they can't just go around killing all the civilians. That would be the only way to outright win many times in fourth generation warfare is just kill everybody. And they can't do that because they can't tell the difference between a regular civilian and a revolutionary. So it's a quandary for the military. It's very, very difficult for them to get a decisive victory. So let's go to our scorecard here. Let's call it battle logistics. Infrastructure, fourth generation warfare. On this factor, the right has a big advantage. Infrastructure vulnerabilities alone make it possible for the right wing to gain desperation for restoration of order to make their demands and get what they want with relatively few men taking action. The military needs to follow a chain of command in order to operate with any type of effectiveness. And that chain of command can be very easily disrupted by logistics problems, infrastructure problems, communications problems, and even desertions, as we'll get to in a minute. In contrast, the revolutionaries can just follow a simple template, which is hit and hide. With, for the most part, freedom from needing coordinated communications, logistics, infrastructure chain of command. So a big advantage to the right here. 
Now, one more comment before we go on here. One guy said to me one time, he said, well, the government could just go in and arm the left wingers. And my response to that was, okay, so you're saying that while there's chaos and rioting and looting in these big blue cities, the military is going to go in there and start handing out guns? That's really what you're saying? And it's not just handing out a gun. I mean, they're not going to do that. But even if they did, how do you train people in a chaos environment where there's shortages of electricity, food, water? Who's going to sit here and train these leftists to use their guns in that kind of an environment? And also for the left establishments to start handing out guns would be to openly admit that they were wrong about gun policy all along and admit that civilians do need guns. So if they're going to do that, they might as well put out an announcement that says we are wrong and we are stupid and we're fighting against the people who've been right all along about gun rights. So now let's move on to another massively important factor that this claimed former government red team planner talks about. He says a significant majority between 55 and 70 percent of the military would defect to the side of the citizens. The problem with suppressing the people with a military that literature and fantasy tend to overlook or ignore is that the military is the people too. In order to get any military to fight their own, you first have to convince them that it is necessary to do so, that it is justified. The communists also ran into this problem, but they overcame it with psychological conditioning and creating a dog-eat-dog -dog atmosphere within the military. The American government has actively recruited people who are patriotic, practical, brave, who have civilian families, and they've reinforced those values throughout the training process. And so the government lacks the ability to convince the majority of their fighting force to engage against their own people. The moment a civil war breaks out, over half of the American military will defect to the rebel side. They will bring military gear with them and more dangerous military training. It only takes one Navy SEAL or Army Ranger to potentially train hundreds of civilians into a dangerous resistance force. They've done it before in other nations. You can be damn sure they can do it on their own home turf. The estimated desertion rate in case of a civil war is 75% if there's a left-wing president. 50% of that would be assumed to immediately betray the president. The remaining military would be fighting its own. Yet another front created in the war. Additionally, there is an assumed 25-50% to 50 desertion or outright betrayal rate in the three-letter government agencies. Additionally, it is assumed that 5% of the initial 50% betrayers would stay in their job and become saboteurs. 10% of that 50% would contain key information that would be of critical danger to the U.S. government. Of that 10%, 1% would be able to deliver that information to the U.S. foreign enemies. What you should get from all this is that the second the United States government declares war on its own people is the second it ceases to exist as the state we know it. Now, even if you think these desertion rate numbers are high, even if it's 30%, 20, 25%, and again, remember, two-thirds of the military voted Trump. So the left establishment would be asking these guys to go out and shoot and jail their fellow Trump voters. How likely do you think that is to happen, that you're going to get anywhere close to 100% obedience? You're not. Even if you think it's just 20% or 25% desertion rate, the military cannot operate like that, folks. They've got to have everybody obeying. Otherwise, things break down massively. And he continues the description here. The moment a civil war starts, not only does America lose over half its military to the cause, but their own command structure will suddenly be infested with moles, plants, and traitors. There would be almost no way of knowing who is actually on their side and who is supporting the uprising. Worse yet, if one of these people happens to be the captain of one of the nuclear submarines on standby on dark water, the civil war is already lost before it even gets started. So I'm going to add my two cents to this here. I recently read an article by a military veteran, and I can't find the article now. If I find it, I'll link it in the description. But this military veteran said two things that really struck me. Number one, he said that when he talks to left-wingers about the possibility of civil war in America, he's amazed at how naive they are. He says they think that if the grassroots right starts a revolution, that the military is just going to waltz in and mow them all down and put them all in jail. And he said, as a military veteran, I tell these leftists straight out, that is just not going to happen. And the second thing this guy said, which really struck me, was that the scariest conversations he's ever heard is when he listened in on conversations by fellow military veteran friends of his about how easily they could bring America to its knees if they wanted to, just with infrastructure hits. He said, that's the scariest thing I've ever heard.
This article from the military veteran that I read is anecdotal, of course, but it matches up with the data and with this analysis we've been looking at. So let's go to our scoreboard here with the factor of military action boots on the ground. Let's call it a tie. The establishment left would have the ability to give orders to the military, but two-thirds of the military voted for Trump, and many of them are just going to refuse to do that or defect or defect in place, and the military can't operate this way. They need full obedience, and even if they get full obedience, even if there were no infrastructure problems, they're already drastically outnumbered by the grassroots right. So even with full obedience, it'd be hard for them to defeat the grassroots right. So military action boots on the ground, let's call it a tie. If you want to, you can call it advantage left if you think that there won't be very many desertions, but I'm going to call it a tie based on the data. Another factor here, let's talk about the former military people in the civilian population. Big advantage here to the right wing. There are many times more former military in the civilian population than there are active military. And the great majority of these former military are grassroots right wing and are heavily armed and are able to train others and have in-depth knowledge of how the military operates. So there's a big advantage to the right wing here. Military weaponry. Let's give the advantage to the establishment in the left because obviously the military has advanced weaponry that the grassroots right wing would not have, at least at the beginning. But again, their ability to use this would be somewhat limited or very limited because of the realities of fourth generation warfare. One other thing I hear from people sometimes is, what about secret military magic weapons? Well, even if they exist, who do you aim the weapon at? How do you tell the difference between a revolutionary and civilians who are just trying to protect themselves and survive? You can't do nukes. You can't do chemical weapons for PR reasons and practical reasons. It would kill more blue people than red people anyway. People say, well, there's swarms of drones. Okay, so how do you program a drone to tell the difference between a revolutionary and a civilian who's just trying to protect himself and his family? How do you program a drone to tell the difference between a group of revolutionaries and a group of regular civilians who are just banding together to try to protect themselves against roving gangs? How can a drone tell the difference? It's not like the revolutionaries are going to be wearing uniforms and going around advertising who they are. So any ability to use vastly superior weaponry or any super weapons, if they exist, would be dramatically hampered and limited by infrastructure problems, military defections, the nature of fourth generation warfare, and the limitation also of having to manage perceptions to the international community where you're fighting against your own population and their civilians and revolutionaries could suffer losses and claim that they're civilians. You killed a bunch of civilians. You see the problem here. Nukes. I'm going to call it a tie. In my opinion, it's unlikely that nukes will come into play. The establishment left would be very unlikely to use it on their own population because that would advertise we're such an illegitimate government that we have to nuke our own people to maintain control. And then even if they wanted to drop a nuke, where would they drop it where it doesn't kill more blue people than red people? Because the blue people are more crowded together than the red people. And every major city has blue people right in the center of it. The right wing might drop one on D.C. or New York or L.A. or San Francisco if they had the chance. But again, I think it's highly unlikely because it would turn international opinion against the grassroots right way too much. And it would probably be totally unnecessary given how easy it is for them to disrupt infrastructure and create chaos that way. So let's call nukes a tie. All right, let's go to the next factor that this former red team planner talks about here. Taking America in a land war is almost impossible. The U.S. has way too many choke points, and the government forces would often be on the wrong side of them. This ties into the logistical nightmare, but it also has to do with an odd phenomenon, which is that liberals like to live near the ocean. Many of the dividers of the country, like the Rocky Mountains, the Mississippi River, Appalachia, the Missouri River, are red state areas. And of course, air travel is a thing, but a majority of the U.S. government's needs would have to travel by ground. And even still, many of the major airports are outside of the city. And of course, the U.S. would use military base airfields, but if civil war did break out, which bases would be safe? Which ones would have fallen to the deserters? The United States is absolutely full of natural terrain choke points, making marching an army across it against armed resistance almost impossible. And it's large enough that no sustained air campaign would be possible. The Japanese Admiralty realized this themselves during World War II, which is why many of them were against attempting to invade. Also, by an interesting coincidence, most of those choke points are in hard conservative states where the resistance would be strongest. The government would lack the ability to reclaim its own land by force, especially when the previous point about infrastructure is taken into account. President Lincoln, on the matter of potential European involvement in the first American Civil War, stated, All the armies of Europe with Bonaparte as a commander could not take a drink from the Ohio. 
So I'll add my commentary to this, which is simply that the center of the United States, the red area of the country, flyover country, is totally self-sufficient in every way when it comes to the basic needs of life. They literally need no one else. They don't need international supplies of anything. They don't need the coasts at all. They can supply their own food, all their basic needs they have available to them. The coast, the blue areas, are heavily reliant on the center in that regard. And if supplies were cut off from the center, they would need much heavier shipments and help from overseas, which obviously takes a while. It takes ships a while to arrive. And of course, it's difficult to supply everybody and distribute everything when there's no electricity, when there's no communications, there's total chaos, there's roving gangs, etc. I mean, look at this map of the Clinton archipelagos. The leftists are almost all crammed into a few tiny geographical areas, these big coastal cities. So if you want to look at some interesting information about how the center of the United States does not need anybody for anything, watch a video that I'll link in the description by a guy named Peter Zihan, who's a geopolitical expert who talks about this. So on our scorecard, the geography factor, big advantage to the right wing. All right, we're down to the last two big factors here international involvement this is what this guy says russia has already publicly stated that it will support any rebellion in the united states against the establishment government and will send troops and aid to support the resistance this is pretty self-explanatory the last thing the government would need during a civil war is russia breathing down its neck but they would get exactly that to supplement two-thirds of their own military leaving and civilians being trained by military elites spetsnaz would drop in and the resistance would get armor and air support from the only other nation on the planet that stands a decent chance of fighting us openly and winning. So I agree with the fact that Russia could very well supply armor and arms to the grassroots right wing. I think it's less likely that any foreign country would actually put boots on the ground in America with their own military, including Russia. Because if you think about it, the United States of America, the biggest purchasing power nation on earth, a lot of these economies all over the world are completely dependent or almost completely dependent on the U.S. economy to continue running. They're just going to want it to be over with as fast as possible so we can get back to business as usual and they can keep making money. So I'm not going to say there's a zero chance of boots on the ground, but I think it's less likely than what this analysis is saying. Some people also point out China might help the left. I think it's very unlikely they would put boots on the ground. They don't actually have that much international expansionary military capability, but they could very well supply the left wing with arms or finance or whatnot if it came to that. But again, their economy is almost completely dependent on American buying power. Some people also say, oh, NATO and the United Nations would send in troops. And some people say that as if it's some kind of a trump card for the left establishment. And I just have to laugh. I mean, NATO has a grand total of 400,000 forces. So they can't just all abandon their posts. And by the way, that reminds me of a good point I think I forgot to make about the U.S. military, which is a lot of the U.S. military is overseas. They're tied up in all sorts of stations. They can't just leave everything they're doing and drop everything and come back to America. So that takes a lot of the military out of the picture as well. And all these NATO forces can't just abandon their posts and fly over to the United States to do whatever. And if you look at the United Nations, they've only got 90,000 peacekeeping forces and 10,000 UN police. And those people can't all abandon their posts either. So these are very small numbers here in the grand scheme, especially when you remember how huge America is. You've got 50 million, at the very least, 35 million grassroots right-wing men. That's just the men alone in America that would be at the very least sympathetic to the revolution if not outright willing to act. So NATO and the UN, I can see the left establishment trying to bring them in, but it's not going to be a huge factor. And again, if you look at NATO, they're not going to be keen to drop all their defenses and send all their troops over here, while Big Daddy USA, who they're relying on almost totally to defend them, is in turmoil. They're not going to take their troops, which is the only thing they have defending them if the United States is distracted and send them over to the United States, I mean, maybe they would, but they'd be leaving themselves completely and totally defenseless. So they're not going to be able to send that many people over to America because they got to defend themselves too. And then also, and this is why I think that any involvement by a foreign nation's army is unlikely, is that any boots on the ground involvement by a foreign army would be considered a violation of the post-war consensus on borders that we don't invade each other militarily. And the purpose of this consensus is obviously to avoid another world war. And it would be a violation of the Westphalian sovereignty, which is the idea that nation states are responsible for factions and conflicts within their own borders. Now, it's not totally unheard of for these norms to be violated, but for outside nations to violate them and invade the most powerful nation in the world that has nukes, by the way, is quite unlikely in my opinion.
So let's go to our scorecard, help from overseas or overseas military financial arms help. On this factor, I think it's a tie. If the conflict lasted long enough, Russia or others might aid the right wing with arms and supplies. China, NATO, the UN might aid the left wing with arms or supplies. But overall, it's going to be basically a tie probably and not enough on either side probably to completely turn the tide toward one side or the other. Last factor, mainstream media and public relations. This guy says here, the media fear mongers because it's profitable. The media for all of its paid shillery would give coverage of everything the resistance does because it is immensely profitable for them to do so. It would be guaranteed views. The only response the establishment would have would be to either allow it or order a total media blackout on the rebellion. Either way, they lose because both outcomes would awaken hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. So the grassroots right can only win in the media arena and the establishment left can only lose. It's merely a matter of what they think will minimize their losses. The revolution would be a PR nightmare for the left establishment. Every rebel killed on TV would be spun by foreign news and alternative media not owned by the government as the U.S. government killed X number of civilians today in a strike. And that is if the U.S. media could even function in a civil war or uprising. The rebels know that the main thing that holds together the United States as we know it is the 24-hour news cycle in the media. The second it's gone, you're going to have urban anarchy. If you're from America, can you imagine a day without TV, newspaper, or the internet? Your average urban youth cannot. If you don't think that isn't going to cause rioting, you must have a really high regard for how much restraint they have. Assume in a civil war that your ability to talk to the people is compromised. Also assume that in the case of a civil war that rebels may know how to monitor conversations like the U.S. does as there are manuals online on how to do so. So I will add to this analysis, the American public in general already has a very low regard for Congress, which has single digit approval ratings, and they have very low regard for the media, lower than ever in history. The grassroots right wing already has zero trust in big media or in our current government, including most of its own congressmen and politicians. Trump voters elected Trump as a big middle finger to the establishment, including their own Republican politicians and to the mainstream media. And they absolutely love how Trump attacks the media. So the grassroots right wing and the alternative right wing media would paint everything that the left establishment does as evil or at best morally compromised. And on the flip side, the mainstream media would be trying to make the government look good and to pacify or motivate the left. But the vast majority of people that still trust mainstream media at all don't have guns because they're leftists. So they're useless as far as being foot soldiers. And the vast majority of the grassroots right wing can't be convinced by the mainstream media or the government of anything anyway because they don't trust them. So then you have the politically disengaged middle, some centrists. Most of the middle politically is either politically disengaged or some of them are true political centrists, but a huge number of them are just politically disengaged. So the middle portion is just going to want it all to end. And even if the mainstream media can somehow convince them of how evil the grassroots right wing revolutionaries are, the politically disengaged middle is not going to be motivated to fight. They're just going to be motivated to survive. And they'll realize that the grassroots right is deadly serious about not being ruled by the left. And so these centrists and the politically disengaged people are just going to want it to end as soon as possible. And they're going to be bitter at the government, too, because the government isn't able to please or serve or even control such a huge portion of the population and avoid it from breaking out into war. So this plays into the plan of the grassroots right which would be to create massive demand for restoration of order so that the government makes a deal with the revolutionaries or so that the military takes over the government out of desperation and makes a deal with the revolutionaries. So it's very hard for a government to look good in a civil war scenario, except to the global Western elites who have no real power because they have no enforcement arm except for the U.S. military, which is not really on their side, and to leftists who have no power because they have no enforcement arm. In other words, they have no guns. So when it comes to PR and media, the advantage goes to the right wing, or a better way to say it would be that the left establishment has a disadvantage because it's very hard for them to look good. They have to be much more restrained in how they attack civilians militarily. They have to paint everything carefully from a PR perspective, whereas the grassroots right wing has much, much less to lose and can act with much more freedom, both militarily and as far as what they're trying to gain. They already have their core people on their side. The politically disengaged middle and centrists are just going to 
know, wanted to end, which plays into the plans of what the grassroots right wing strategy would be. And of course, the left would be listening to the mainstream media, but that doesn't matter because the left doesn't have any guns anyway, so they can't act or make a difference anyway. So the last part of this guy's analysis is about nukes. The last resort, Catch-22, the U.S. has an enormous stockpile of munitions and explosives up to and including a massive number of nuclear warheads, but they cannot use any of this in this civil war. The establishment has to play a game of we're the good guys with the rest of the world while this is all taking place. There will be lines they cannot cross because to do so would elevate the issue from being an internal matter to an international one. The moment they throw an ICBM at Ohio, it stops being a civil war and becomes an international relief effort where the other militaries of other first world nations come to save the American people from their own out of control and tyrannical government. Now, I don't know if this would necessarily be the case because the other Western governments are in the hands of the liberal elite. So I'm not sure about that, but the rest of the world certainly does not see America and the current American establishment elite as favorably as the Western European governments do. Meanwhile, he says, and this is a good point, the rebellion is not nearly so limited as far as a hypothetical nuclear submarine captain goes. Uh, I think they are somewhat limited, but he's making the point here, which is good, which is that the rebels are not as limited as far as the actions they're taking because they're not fighting from a position of we already have the power and we're the good guys and we can maintain control, which is a harder position to defend. The rebels have much less to lose, everything to gain, and so they have more freedom in their strategy, put it that way. And so he concludes here, the United States will never nuke its own people. The second it does, they have lost the civil war and other countries will come to liberate the U.S. from its own repressive regime. And additionally, if any general, Minuteman, nuke tech, or nuke subcaptain decided to side with the rebellion, the U.S. government is immediately SOL. Again, I'm not 100% sure about that, but in any case, I think it's pretty safe to say the United States is not going to drop a nuke on its own people, and they have more of a tough time as far as the PR because they have to play like they're the good guys and they're more limited in their strategy because of it. So he closes by saying this, in short, the second a civilian uprising or extremist group terrorist attack turns into civil war is the second the United States loses. As a result, you will never see the American government actually declare civil war against its people. You will see Waco, you will see Bundy Ranch, you will see all sorts of militant group confrontations and maybe even some skirmishes, but the U.S. government fears its own people way too much to ever start an actual civil war that they declare we are declaring war against our people. And he says, as an American, I want all the Americans here to remember this. The government is against you almost openly now, but they also know that they cannot win if it comes to open war. We have a trump card they cannot match. If it comes to a fight, they will lose. So there are elements in the establishment who will do absolutely everything in their power to prevent it from coming to that. The U.S. government is not in support of its people and the people are not in support of the government. It is within the means of certain interests to start World War III simply as a distraction to avoid an American civil war because by their reckoning, it's better to ruin other lesser nations and spill the blood of patriots than lose their own grip on power. So he says, remember that World War III itself could be a deliberate false flag to prevent a power change in America. So that's an interesting take as well. So I think we've covered all the major bases. I cannot think of any other major factors that this analysis misses when we combine what this guy is saying here, what his claimed analysis by the U.S. government is. And when you add in my analysis and my color to it, I can't think of any big factors that I'm missing. If you can think of one, put it in the comments. But let's close by looking at our scorecard here. And you can see, this is not exactly scientific, if you know what I mean, but it gives us a good 30,000 foot view. You can see that the right wing has the advantage in almost every area in a civil war scenario. So at this point, the only open question is, would the right wing actually fight sufficiently to create this type of scenario? And if you're looking for the answer to that question, I would simply remind you that the grassroots right wing is going to find themselves in the position where they have zero political power in the current system. They will not be able to win any more national level elections simply because of immigration. And they're going to find themselves in a position where their choice is to be ruled by commie social justice warriors forever or start a fight like this. This is why I advocate for peaceful separation, because civil war in America is virtually inevitable. And if you're a leftist still watching at this point and you have half a brain, you need to start advocating for peaceful separation as well, because your chances in a civil war are not good. 
That's all I have for you today. Make sure you're subscribed to my channel so you can check out my upcoming interview with a former member of the Special Forces. He's got some really interesting takes that I think you're going to find fascinating. And also just to remind everybody, nothing in this video should be construed as me advocating that you take any action other than to protect yourself and your loved ones should a scenario like this occur. Thank you all very much. I love you. Till next time.